right on six o'clock. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome six o'clock Tuesday. This is a really late lecture, so well done for turning up. I hope I would have when I was a student. It's pretty tough. Um, hope you're not hungry because I'd be falling asleep and hungry if I was doing this. I am, so <laughs> good luck. Um, okay, second lecture. I just thought I'd put the schedule up at the start so you get an idea of where we are. It's like second lecture, so it's a bit silly, but get an idea of what's coming up. So you got me for another nine lectures, and then you're going to get a handover to someone. Oh, Yoni's in the middle there for a, when Amy's giving a talk. Then you're going to go over to Andy, who is an ex-colleague of mine. So we know each other really well. Um, he's a really good developer. He's contributed to Core Julia. So I can introduce you to this stuff. And when you have hard questions, I can just hand you straight over to Andy. So he's a good resource to have. Um, great guy as well. Um, OK, so hopefully that's not too laggy today. It was pretty terrible yesterday. I think it's still pretty laggy. OK, sorry, I hit it the wrong direction. Okay, that's Prax. Oh, I found I'm missing where I'm at. I went too far down. Okay, that's that. So we're in unit one. So whole idea of unit one is we're going to cover some basic introductions. So I gave you a nice gentle introduction to, you know, nice little toy problem pretty much using Monte Carlo sampling and a little bit of analysis to show that give you a bit of confidence that's right. Introduce some Julia syntax. That was the first part, a little bit of history about computers and hopefully where, you know, where, where, where the history of all this stuff's coming from, because I think it's really important to know. Um, it's also, so we can get a little bit further into that, of like where Julia sits in the, in the scheme of all these languages, because you sort of come along at the end. Um, it's kind of exciting. There's all these new languages coming out built in a similar way to Julia. So. Who knows what the next interesting one's going to be? One of these constants when you're doing software is stuff keeps changing. You don't sit on the same knowledge forever. So new thing comes along every couple of years. It's kind of normal. So learning a new language is a good thing. And one of the things I say, especially if you're a bit of a beginner, it's not a huge jump to go from one language to another. It's like some languages are harder than others. Like some are notoriously difficult. Like programming in assembly is difficult. That's horrible. But you can't do much. So people don't tend to do a lot. Programming in lower level languages, they're all high level languages because they're compiled, but like something like C++ is a bit of a reputation of being tough to learn, but um, we're up in the nice high level languages. So hopefully this is easy and changing from one to another. It's all a lot of transferable stuff. It's sort of um, convergence in design, thinking about how, like one of the interesting things about Julia is they've taken a lot of information on board about how people learn programming languages in the design. So see if that actually works people are still iterating on this stuff so i think it's interesting like um you guys would be too old but my kids play roblox and it's got lua as a scripting language and it looks a lot like julia it's a really similar to this type of language um so it's interesting to see what kids learn i was also my my youngest son on the weekend wanted to learn programming so i gave him a little hello world thing in python and we did it and then at the end of it he said oh dad it's really boring to and it takes a long time to do a little bit like, yes, <laughs> that's what it's like doing software. But you can do some cool stuff. Um, talked a bit about basic data types. So the most basic thing is bits. And then first interesting data type as a mathematician is integers. I think we went through this stuff. Um, I went through about how addition works kind of in hardware as a program. So you can see what's going on. Hopefully this learning this was a bit of a jump up, you're thinking difficulty, but hopefully I didn't lose you. I would completely encourage you to pull this apart, go to the REPL, go through line by line, just see what's going on at every step so you understand it. Um, you, there's a non-negotiable amount of suffering when you're learning a programming language. You kind of have to keep doing stuff. It's just the only way you learn. It's When you get past a certain age, it gets really hard to learn a new language because you just can't be bothered anymore. You just want to stick with what you've done, but um, you guys are younger, so... You can, it's, it's not so bad. Um, okay. So, all right. This is like probably like the normal starting point is doing a Hello World program. I guess this has a history that goes back quite a long time. It goes back to the C language, I think, or even before that in the 70s. It's meant to be just a simple introduction to um, the language itself. And you see a little bit of syntax. We kind of did that with the, it was a really big Matsy Hello World where we did like the Monte Carlo stuff. So 
I think it's useful to repeat. My mouse is not working on me, which is great. Um, is that big enough? You can see the text. So this is like the most boring hello world in the world. So you just start Julia. Hopefully you've all started Julia. I'm starting it as a REPL session and you can go print learn. I can't spell. <laughs> That's boring, right? Um, how the big, more interesting thing with a language like Julia is how you interact with it. Um, this, I guess some of you have a lot of experience programming, some of you not so much. Like programs are not much more than just files. So we'll talk a little bit more about editors and IDEs. Um, oh, you can see my bash RC file. New file, create new file. No, why are you not letting me do that? Uh, you as well. Okay, so we'll just go print, learn. Okay, and we'll go, I'm struggling with this mouse today. File, save. And because it's stolen my focus, I can't actually see. We'll just call this guy. Hello, dot jail. Okay. Our terminal. So I'm in a code editor called VS Code. It's sort of become super popular. It's a very lightweight code editor. We'll talk a bit more about this later on. But you know, this is just the text file. This is not a really boring thing. This hello.jail. There's nothing special about it. It's just text. You can write programs in any old text editor, notepad doesn't matter. It's just that when you go to use, do more stuff, it gets easier to do, you know, it gets easy, it makes it easy for you. So, but one of the things you might notice in this code editor is it's doing a little bit of syntax highlighting. So it's picked up from the extension, I called it .jl. So you usually use for the text files with Julia code in them, that it's given me syntax highlighting. So it goes like, oh, this thing's a function. I know it's hello world. I'll put the string in red and I'll put the, um, the function in blue. So, should see that hello.jl is here. If I go Julia, hello, it'll print hello world to stand it out. That's another way you will interact with programs, just from command line. Um, another way, has everyone got iJulia installed yet? Has everyone had a go at that? I don't even need to do this. So I panicked and did this just before I came in because I don't usually use notepads. So I had to quickly make sure it was installed before I come here. So useful thing again is what I'm doing is like, I'm lazy and I can't remember what anything's called. I remember it's note something or other. So I start typing note, notebook, it's a function, start it up. We'll print out some stuff. We'll start a web session. We're gonna go new, Julia notebook. And this is just the same thing. Um, you're probably really familiar with this if you've used a Jupyter notebook before. Ju I don't know what the ter bit is, but it's meant to be Julia, Python, and R is what it was designed for. That's where the name comes from. I don't know what the ter bit is, though, um, if anyone else knows. So you can do the same stuff that you would do in a REPL session here. So you can go using plots, shift enter to execute the thing. One of these things people complain about with Julia is the startup time. You'll notice that, that it's going chug, 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 chug in the background. So. Um, you can just never stop a session, I guess. So they're working on it. It will get better. So same, if you want to plot something, takes a while, chug, 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 chug. What it's actually doing, this is one of the downsides of Julia is it's doing a lot of pre-compilation in the background. So it's usually only slow the first time you run it. So this one's kind of outrageous at the moment. Hey, go print line. Uh, slow and then if you do plot again maybe not so much oh. it's fast second time so it's only a startup problem it's doing pre-compilation one of the things that every new version of julia coming out they're making this stuff faster um it's a lot better than it was um okay so there's a couple of examples here um a little bit more syntax. So this is 
So flexible data types with Julia is you can make arrays of any old thing. So I think I'll close that. So I don't, I'd prefer the REPL. Well, maybe I'm stuck, I'm stuck. <laughs> Gonna have to use the iPython notebook. Let's kill that. New page. And they're good. Okay. So X equals. So before we would have done some arrays. One, two, three. You can have an array and it will give you a hint about the type. So yesterday I was talking all about integers. So this is an array of in 64s. If I'd had an array with a dot, it will go, oh, so these are these things that I haven't talked so much about yet. They're floating point numbers, which are funny things that are pretending to be real numbers. Um, you can also have an array of strings, A, which is what it was in this example, B. So you use quotes to make strings, which are symbols, and you can have a mixed array, which will probably go type any. So one of the, you know, Julia is super flexible with the types. You can have an array of type any. As soon as a Julia, this is one of the performance things that we'll get to later on. As soon as it can't work out the type or sorry, it casts it to any, everything's gonna go slow because it's got to check all these different methods as it goes through. Um, what else is there to say about that? Um, okay, so now this is one of the people, one of the things people, a lot of people get really mad about the array indexing. So I don't, I'm sort of like, I've done too much programming, so I don't care. I just need to remember which language I'm using. But if you're in Julia, the first element is the first element. It's not the zeroth element, unless you want it to be. <laughs> so one of these things, Julia is a bit too flexible. There's a, actually a package where you can define arbitrary offsets to arrays if it makes you so mad that you want to do that. Um, so, but as a thing, it's like the first is, the first element, if you want to get the last, it's the end. If you want to iterate through for I. So usually I keep, I, I sort of don't want to say this too early, but generally it's a little bit of a bad habit if you're actually indexing into the array, you don't usually need to. Usually you want an iterator. So you would have seen this yesterday, I would have gone something like for XX in X. print um, xx and so to do that so i didn't need to say where it was in the array equivalent equivalent thing you can do is you can go for i in one two three print sorry for i in one two three print x i should do the same thing um Maybe a better pattern, if you're not sure about what you're dealing with, is to use something called enumerate. It's a little bit safer. This will, that's a, probably want to put a space in there or something, but you get the idea that I is the index for the array. When you enumerate, you get a tuple. That's the little thing in round brackets. That's what that's called. First bit is the index into the array. Second bit's the element of the array. That's much more useful pattern. I often find though that like this is, I'll come back to this later when I've talked a bit more about types that maybe you didn't want an array of basic types if you're doing this kind of thing. Um, it usually means you've done something a little bit wrong and your data model is a little bit off for what you're trying to do. Usually you're trying to do this stuff when you're gonna, I'm gonna go down to the third element in this list and then go to this other list and that's why I want this thing. It's like, probably shouldn't be doing that. You should have a more flexible array. Very early to tell you guys this. So some of you will go like, yeah, yeah. Other ones will be like, What's he talking about? Um, hope that's clear. Um, another bit of useful syntax. Everyone who's familiar with a list comprehension from Python, seen that before? Hands up. Who's never heard of it? One guy. A couple of guys. So this one's useful, super useful. Um, what you can actually do is you can put a function in there. So if I put so again, this iteration syntax for i in naught to 10, I'm gonna do this function on i, it'll return the squares of i. So as it goes through, so it iterates through the array, does that thing. Because Julia is crazy, you can make a function. Um, 
x squared minus two. It's a really bad name. I'm sorry, everyone. X squared. And I can actually put that in the squares is not going to be so valid anymore. But. Cool. Sorry, I didn't do curly brackets. So you can put a function in there, do the same thing. So it's kind of cool. Another equivalent syntax is you can define a map. Um, maybe I won't say too much about this. X goes to X squared. Oh, 10. That's the same thing. So this is another syntax that does the same thing. I think underneath they're actually doing the same thing. It's just a nice bit of syntax where the comprehension points to the map. So it means map this function over this iterator. This is the Julia syntax for something called anonymous function. We'll talk about this later. Don't worry about it too much now. Anonymous in that it has no name. I've made a function, it has no name. Um, cool. That's some cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's saying the same stuff. Oh, broadcasting too. So if we do squares, I'll get back to the original squares. Um, I think this is kind of a nasty syntax, but this little dot means I'm going to apply it element wise over the array. So another thing you can do. So if I do that to squares, it'll go back to what it was originally. So that little dot, if you see that, it means broadcast this you know, works on one variable over the array. Um, super useful, super useful shorthand. Not a big fan of that syntax though. So when I say syntax, it's like that dot means that because it's kind of like hard to see and you miss it sometimes. Any questions? This stuff's pretty basic, but. Ah, everyone's happy. Oh yeah. Yes. That's a good question. I'm not sure if it's clever enough. It's got to be able to work out which one it's doing. So like if they're both the same shape, it will probably work. I can't say off the top of my head if I'm sure if that works or not. Question, I'll get back to you on that one about exactly. We could just try it, but I think it's better to find out the docs and see what it says. But um, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, there's always that problem with broadcasting about working out which, like if you had one going this way and one going this way, you're going to go over that one or that one? It's ambiguous. If it's not ambiguous, I think it has a go. Um, okay, so hopefully I didn't spend too long on that. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about data types. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about floats, but not in detail. This will come back when we talk about numerical methods. Um, Um, so when, it come, when we come back to new records to talk about derivatives, this stuff will come back again. Um, I'll go in more detail about details of floating point because it's a huge problem when you're trying to do maths on a computer. Um, so we've got some examples here. So again, as I was saying about like the tables of logarithms, tables of signs and causes, I think square roots a nice function to look at. Um, and if you wonder about like what's actually going on when you put square root into a function, like it has to be implemented somewhere. So we'll do it. What's the example they've given in the notes? So I think this is pretty much. So you'll notice some funny stuff. So square root of 25 is a good one. Square root of 25 just gives you five. But let's notice some funny stuff going on. If we do square root of two squared. So I'll just try this in one line. Um, you notice something that's happened there, everyone? A little bit of fluff came on the end. This is like this great feature of floating point that it's not precise. Like you lose, you always get this little bit of randomness, not almost randomness, there's a little bit of fluff that comes through with some operations. And also sometimes things disappear, which is great. Um, we will cover this in a bit more detail about like where this is coming from, 
what can you do to try and not run into it so often? But um, I guess, you know, everything is a function here. So another one, if we try a square root, this one is iconic to me because this was the first bug I had in Julia. It really confused me. I accidentally got a square root minus of a negative number. It won't do it. That's like pretty obvious if you maths because it's, it's defined on the reals. Square root of minus one is a complex number. This is a type thing. So actually the the um, the error of message is super useful. Square root will return a complex result if called with a complex argument. Try square root complex x. So what is complex? A complex number type with real and imaginary part of type t. So if I go complex minus one, that's a complex number now. So I can go, if I want to know what this is, type of complex one, complex in 64. We also get complex float 64. That's fine. Um, so now if I try square root, square root of complex minus one. Hey, we get imaginary. Cool. All right, so that's, you also get, you know, nice little, again, talk about all this funky syntax. You can do that if you want to. Um, I don't know if that's good or not, but you can do that. <laughs> um, make your own opinions. If I do do that, what does it mean? I can do the help thing I did. It's quite a lot of help for square root. So you can get, that's just aliasing to square root of X. That's just calling the same function. It tells you it's gonna throw a domain error if it's um, negative real. So that's fine. Um, it's got actually got documentations on how it's doing it. Um, if you wanna go and look up a paper, go knock yourself out. That will be probably super interesting actually. Um, so that's where we're going to. Um, okay, this is this another bit of syntax here is this little at syntax is a macro. Anyone familiar with what a macro is? You want to have a go? What's a macro? <laughs> yeah, it's, you can kind of think of it as like a program that writes programs is a simple way of thinking about it. So this is a useful macro that tells you which version of square root you're using. So this is one of the things you'll notice if I run this. Oh, which square root two? So it gives you the line in um, base.math, math.jl, that's the line number, 1,218. In the notes, um, it's kind of cool. You've got the hyperlink there. If you want to go to the Julia source code, open source, you can see what it's doing there. Um, this is kind of, so it's changing it to a float and it's going to throw an error. Otherwise it's going to do something else. Um, cool, that's useful. Um, you'll see it will move to another line if we give it a real type. So this is one of these things I think I mentioned to one of you yesterday is like, Julia has this thing called multiple dispatch. Talk about this later. It's kind of at this level, it's kind of not important, but you have the same function for different types and you can use different types with the same function. It actually ends up being really useful for writing short code. It's one of the magical things about Julia. Um, it's actually, a lot of people are struggling with it, with Julia, with testing, because you can compose things. You can write a package for one thing, write a package for another thing. And without those people talking to each other too much, they can actually work with each other. So one of the, they give lots of examples of this, of like, um, propagating errors through functions. There's a package for doing that. I um, can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but you can write your function, do this thing. It will pass through the error, do the error propagation through you through the functions, which is really useful. Um, um, this composition though can lead to weird bugs and very hard to test code in a way. So people are, it's frontiers of knowledge stuff. So that's kind of fun. Um, basically the point was, can have a look through the code. You can actually go to the source code. It's very cool that Julia is open source. Um, you can go and see how these things are implemented. Um, we just talked about this stuff, list comprehension and broadcasting. Um, 
don't think we skipped anything there. Okay, so what we're gonna to get to though, how do you actually do a square root? Like it's a function, you know what it is, so the inverse of the square, the inverse function of squaring something, but how do you actually do it mechanically? Um, we can get a hint by looking at the code. Um, you're looking in the source code, you find this funny line, there's this bit where it's going like, if X is less than zero for X, um, throw this complex domain error, otherwise call square root LLVM. Um, anyone heard of LLVM? One guy, <laughs> couple of people. Yeah, so this is low level virtual machine. Um, this was a project, I think it was started at a university by Chris Latner, um, kind of famous programmer. Um, I think he went off and worked for Apple after this stuff, but um, low level virtual machine, when we were talking yesterday, is like that the lowest level, you know, it's doing these tiny little operations. And this is, you, if you want to program in that, every different CPU has a different implementation which is when you're doing assembly, this comes from the CPU manufacturer. If you want to program to that CPU, you have to do an assembly for that CPU. That's terrible. So you have this idea of compiled languages, but one step up from this is this low level virtual machine. So you can give it like machine instructions that are generic across. So it's low, LLVM's job to talk to all the different types of CPUs, but you have this low level thing that um, that's very fast and very well implemented. So it's a hint. Um, again, we've got this macro. You can see what the Julia code is in LLVM for this guy. So if you really want your brain to hurt, um, you can look through this stuff. And again, it's like, you do not want to be programming at this level. You want Julia to turn it into LLVM for you. That's what Julia is doing to be fast. It takes this stuff, just in time compiles it down to LLVM, native code runs on your computer. So again, it's just calling this LLVM square root for float 64, but that's pretty much it. So there's some method down in LLVM that does it. So that's super interesting. I don't think I've ever really, I don't really muck around with the, like looking at the low level stuff too much. It's like sometimes when you're trying to do really performance critical stuff, um, this is the equivalent thing in the native code. So I can't demonstrate this, but if I got a different type of CPU, you'd see a different, um, the native code would be um, these really quite incomprehensible things, but um, that's what you don't want. You want to avoid programming. That's why it's nice being up here in the high level land. You don't have to worry about this. Julia compiler is doing it for you. Um, but you can see that's there. Again, not much of a hint about what it's actually doing. Um, again, this is just for float 64 types. If we wanted to do it for big ints, you know, if no one's done it for you, I've got a special type. We might have to implement it ourselves. So what do you do? Um, so this, this, uh, this is, I find this super interesting, this stuff, is that um, how did people do this before computers? How did people do it a long, long time ago? Like, this is kind of a really elementary operation and you'll see it in really old books. Like, how did they approximate these things? So. One of the old ones, really, really old, Babylonian algorithm. So like, I'll give you a demonstration of how you arrive at the Babylonian algorithm post Newton. So like use calculus to derive this result. I really wonder all the time, like how did they actually work this out? Did they just guess and check? I actually don't know. And it's um, super interesting to think about. Like they had algorithms for doing this kind of thing. I don't know where they came from, if they were magic, who knows? Um, as, a, as an equation, this is recursion. So we're going to start with an initial guess, x naught, and then we apply um, this equation, and this will solve eventually the square root. So we've got some syntax here. There's an implementation here. I think it's worth pulling this apart so you can see a little bit more syntax. Uh, let's go. I'll just copy it across. Maybe I don't need to copy it across, but I think it's useful. So we're going to take an input to this function, bab square root. Um, it's probably a bit short, that name, so you don't know what it means. Um, Z is the um, 
the argument you're going to put in. And we have a bunch of optional named arguments here. So if you see this little semicolon, it means you don't need to put these guys in. And if I have a name here, init x equals z on two, it's going to have to be a named argument. So if I put these guys in, it's not positional arguments, it's named arguments. I have to match the name. Um, much less error prone version of using functions. Like you can imagine you write a function like function of A, B, C, and D. And it's like, oh, you flip those around and it's A, C, B, and D. It's probably better to go A equals A, B equals B, C equals C. A little bit safer. So what this is doing is it's putting in an initial guess of Z on two, because why not? You need a, you need a guess to start with. Um, you know, you might have some magical way of coming up with a better first guess than Z on two. Verbose equals false, and some tolerance, one equals e to the minus 10. So we start at the initial x, which was set by z on two when you call this thing. So if I put z equals four, first guess will be two, and then x will be two, x starts at two. So we've got a while loop here. So while true will just mean go into this thing and don't exit until you break. Um, so it will go forever if the tolerance is not reached. Um, this is this other little bit of syntax is we've got this, I think this is kind of, kind of don't like it, but maybe you can see what it does. And, and I think it's probably worth. So again, I'm always going to go question mark. If I see something I don't understand and and is a function. So it's short circuiting Boolean and. So it will only do this second bit if the first bit evaluates to true. That's why it's got a shirt circuit. It's like if it's evaluates to false, it won't bother. It will just go past. So this is a little compact way of going like, if you hit this condition, do this thing. Otherwise, don't. Um, it'll just optimize past it if um, that guy's false. So this is just, you know, in the notes, we had the, the Babylonian algorithm. It's a half times x plus z on x. We're going to calculate a difference. So we're looking at an absolute tolerance change is less than tolerance, then we'll break. And then sets x to next x. So if that's good enough, it'll just stop, then jump out. Um, oh, let's just make that function. I think I just copied it and didn't do anything with it. I think it's good to copy stuff and run stuff. I'll just copy it across. You guys should all do the same. Oh, went too fast for me. It copied in. So we're going to start at 5,000 and put verbose equals true. Um, and you'll see the iterations at every time. So it's doing, so this default tolerance was 1e e to the minus 10. So it should stop when it gets to the dip, the, you know, the changes between subsequent iterations have gotten too small. I can't be bothered going on. So it's returned um, X, which is 70. So we can check against the inbuilt algorithm, 5,000. You know, it's a little different. So BS minus square root. 5,000, okay, that's a pretty small number, 10 to the minus 11. So it seems like it did a good, good job if it's doing something different. If they're both doing the same thing, that's not really a test, but you assume the LLVM one's probably good. Um, okay, so staring at that, anyone got an idea? Oh, first of all, like, or how, how do you think this is working? I'll take a question from any, anyone who wants to have a guess at like how this might be working. And another question I'd put up is like, what do you think is wrong with this code? Like, can you see anything that you don't like if you think about the method? And we'll come back to that after we've talked through it. So does anyone have a guess at like, how would you come up with this de novo? Someone said Newton's method, yay. So I, there's like, um, okay, I'll get in, get this guy big. There's like, when you're doing applied maths, it's like first step, Taylor series, like Newton's method, 
do a Taylor. If there's a function you don't understand, do a Taylor series and then truncate it because then you've got a linear equation usually if you terminate it at one term. It's pretty straightforward. So hopefully I wrote this down correctly. This thing's not great for math formatting, but I tried my best. Um, so what we want to do, struggle to draw here. It's the same again. I have to shrink it a bit so I can actually draw. Okay. No, it's not letting me. Sorry. Should just go on the whiteboard. Um, Why is it doing that? Anyway, we've got a, we've got a Taylor series. Um, so we've got some function and we want to approximate it at a point. So we've got, this is like our starting guess. So what we're actually trying to do with Newton's method is we're going to try and find when this guy hits zero. That's the whole point. So we're going to start at an initial guess. That would be your F of A. So the whole idea is if we truncate this guy at one term, so we don't worry about that second order stuff. You know, we just go, everything above there is probably an error. Uh, is, you know, small, we won't worry about that. Um, we're going to start at initial guess A, and we're going to try, we can actually solve this thing for when f of x equals zero in this linear approximation. So, and this is like this central idea of calculus. Like, say your f of A is at this point. We can approximate the tangent at that point, if I can. And then we can solve this linear equation for when that equals zero. That will be the first iteration of Newton's method. Like, and then we go back up to the function and we do another. Let's see, I'm really struggling with this mouse today. I have to come up with a solution for this. So basically the next iteration is going back up here. And then you do another Taylor series approximation. And hopefully you're getting closer and closer to where this guy crosses zero. So you iterate, 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 iterate. So if you crank through the maths, we're going to set f of x equal to zero, rearrange this thing, and that will be, you know, and then solve for x from the initial guess. What you do, if you do that, you should end up with the Babylonian algorithm. So this is, they've called it x as a recursive equation here. This is Newton's method. So if you rearrange that equation I had over there, solving for zero, you should end up with this one. So it should give you a next guess for X, given my first guess. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, again, it's an affine approximation of X at a point. So it's super simple in this case. Um, if it's a square, you know, it's just going to be two X. So Newton's iterate of the square root are this. Okay, so that's the Babylonian algorithm. So again, like I was saying, it's like, how do you come up with that without calculus? That's really confusing to me. It's like, did they just guess a functional form that looked okay? I don't really know. Um, did they have some super intuition about cal like the ideas of calculus pre-calculus as well is a thing that often happened. One of these things about like finding the areas of the circle and stuff, they did it by exhaustion, like basically Riemann sums, but keep going around. They did it without knowing calculus and just went, oh yeah, it looks like it's going towards that. That'll do. Super interesting. Um, Cool. So what's problematic about that algorithm though? Anyone want to have a guess? Nope. Yeah, might not end. So is this guaranteed to converge? Yeah, so you can have a problematic first guess, or you can have a problematic function, and it might just cycle around forever. Might never do anything. So if we have this. Um, and it's not guaranteed to, to, it's not guaranteed to converge to the correct answer. It's not even guaranteed to monotonically converge to the wrong solution either. So if you had a tolerance like this in a while loop, it may just never, ever, ever hit that. Like, so it may never stop. So this will be a function that just sits there, thrashes your CPU and never stops. So, oh yeah. Yes, that's another problem. So like if your guess is too good, that's like 
Excellent. <laughs> if you guess this too good, it will explode. Um, okay, let's try and fix those. What would you do to fix the first problem about the tolerance? What would be a good guard? We're going to rewrite this program. What would be a good thing we could change? Yeah, that's, that's basically the standard answer is you have a maximum number of iterations. You have a counter that goes over that. Throw, say, oh, this thing's not good. That's the kind of thing you do. You return an answer, but also return like, oh, this isn't, this didn't converge. It's like some convergence flag would be the way to go. Good answer. What about you divide by zero? That's a harder one. What could you do? Yeah, you could, you could, oh yeah, another couple of answers. Let's just see what everyone says, yeah. Yeah, you could check, that's the other thing. You can check if it's precisely zero as a ternary and stop. Uh, yeah, you could, yeah. So basically, that's basically the same idea. You could just check the error of your approximator. Like, is it zero already? Stop, that's fine. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, cool. And in terms of this thing, like you could also fuzz this. Like another thing you can do that's a bit of a dirty trick is if you always add a small tolerance onto a divide, you're never going to hit that zero problem. Um, to give you know it's one sided variable, that's another trick. Like you can just go like the bit on the bottom is never going to go smaller than this. That's something else you might think of doing. Nice. Um, Cool. Okay. I wanted to talk about this because I think it's cool and it's interesting. Um, another super common problem um, is you actually don't want the square root. You want to multiply by one on the square root. So who can think of an application where that might happen? Um, Normalizing vectors. Yes, definitely. So this is another one of my ones is like back to my past of like having to fight with normalization is a very difficult, challenging thing in general. When you say the example I was doing was with um, using rotations. So one way to represent a rotation is anyone, like if you've got a three dimensional rotation, there's lots of different ways you can talk about that. Like you can say it's an Euler angle, which is a roll pitch in your, you can say it's a rotation matrix. Slightly funny one you can do is a quaternion. Is anyone familiar with those? A couple of people nodding their head. So one of these things is you have to preserve only the normalized quaternions are rotations. The other non-normalized quaternions aren't rotations anymore. And you can have some, like, you know, when I was saying this, um, if you go, so square root squared, and you get this little bit of fluff on the end, that, that propagation of error can make you go off and it's not actually a rotation anymore. So you have to worry about normalization. Um, so it comes up all the time when you're dealing with unit vectors. Um, so we've got some stuff. Um, good thing to know is packages. So I already showed this with I, Julia. Um, you would have had some experience. Julia is actually more friendly now. Linear algebra is not, it kind of is and isn't in base. But um, if you want to use the linear algebra stuff, you have to include it. So if I want to do norm of some vector, three, that's fine. Um, that's built in. Um, there's also normalize. Oh, sorry. That norm, that's the norm of the vector. You can also do normalize. Yep. So that will, there's an algorithm implemented that will do normalization for you. Um, Oh, some other stuff, a bit more syntax. You could do it by hand if you want to. That's, um, you know, lots of things you can do. Dot is in linear algebra. That's the dot product between two vectors. Hopefully they all give you the same thing. So I think this is interesting. Yesterday I was saying about it's good to be fast. It's also bad to be incomprehensible. And one of these things you can, one of these things I was saying before, I'm trying to, make the point a bit strongly again is like communication super important 
and it's easy to be clever, but sometimes, you know, put a comment in when you're being clever because nobody else will understand it. This is kind of an infamous example. Um, who's, have, is, any, is anyone familiar with the fast inverse square root method? Got a couple of people. It's kind of in popular culture, I guess. Um, this was when they released the source code for Quake 3, I think is how it came out. And people were going through it and they're like, okay, here's this funny function. So it was written in C. Um, maybe some of you can read C, maybe some of you can't, but it's like syntax isn't too bad for this one. So there's this horrible name, QR square root. So this is trying to do the fast inverse square root. Again, like this type annotation stuff, this is like it takes an input called number that's a float. We're going to define some variables and constants about an iterator, float, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is very, very confusing if you can read C, like what's going on here. So I took this algorithm. So that's actually got a, we've actually commented, but this is the comments from the code of like someone else reading it and going like, what are you doing? Um, it's very, very confusing. So what I've written the equivalent code in Julia, maybe it's easy to understand than C. So it's like a nice little example of Julia being a little bit more friendly. So taking a number, it's a float 32. It's really important that it's a float 32 for this algorithm. So this won't work for float 64s. So there's an equivalent algorithm you can do, just different offsets. Um, take this number and multiply it by a half. Reinterpret the float 32-bit number to a 32-bit unsigned integer. So this is a very, very strange thing to do. So yesterday we were talking about, you know, this is the binary representation of an unsigned integer. Floating point numbers are basically, we'll talk about it more, scientific notation, but for binary. So you've got like a bit out the front multiplied by powers. Um, so why would you take, a, why would you reinterpret this number as a UN32. So you're taking the floating point representation and just pretend it's an integer. So I hope that's clear that that's a very strange thing to do. It's like, take this number and pretend it's a string. Take this number and pretend it's a chicken. Like They're two different things. Why would you even do that? Um, it's very, very confusing. Then we've got this next step where we've got some hex thing. So there's some float32 number. Oh, sorry, some, sorry, some UN number. And we've got a bit shift operation. That was the one I talked about yesterday, two arrows. So like do this magic and then reinterpret it back as a floating point number. And then do one iteration of Newton's method. So again, if you do the Newton's method for a square root, you'll end up with a similar algorithm as the Babylonian algorithm. Um, and you can do one iteration of that and then return that. And apparently this is a good algorithm. So point to note, you know, when we were doing the Babylonian algorithm, how many iterations to get to that tolerance? It was like 10 or so, did a few. This is doing one. So what does that mean? Well, well, yeah, why, why can it's fast because it can do one iteration of Newton's method. So all this pre stuff, this is a bit of a hint about what's going on here. Like all this stuff must mean that something about, you know, it's going to your point before, like what happens if you're really close to the start? So all this stuff must be to make a really, really good first guess. So if you have a really, really, really good first guess, you only need to do one iteration and you'd probably find. So the original code had two iterations and then they commented it out. That's what that line is. So you don't actually need it. So they found that if we do this magic stuff, this magic spell, um, this, oh, I'm going to pretend, pretend it's a, a U int A, do a bit shift with an offset and then turn it back into a floating point number. It's kind of weird. Anyone got any ideas what might be going on? Because the analog of the exponent is in binary, you can just shift it to the right ones. So it halves the 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much right on. So it's like it's kind of like, you can kind of think of it as like taking a logarithm, like and then dividing by two. So it's this is like when you do this bit is this hint of like I think I brushed over it really really quickly yesterday that this is like dividing by two, and it's it's very confusing. <laughs> I'd say the point of this, like if you want to, I've, I've linked a video for you to watch. I won't go through this in detail because we haven't talked about floating points so much, but this, I like this because it's got folklore around it. Um, it's actually like people attribute it to the wrong person constantly. So like John Carmack is the person most people would associate it with. He's a fairly famous software developer making Doom and all those games back in the 90s. Um, they're like, wow, this guy's a genius because like he came up with this magic method and it's really fast. Kind of the wrong way to think about it. Like, I think this is kind of bad. This is like an example of really bad code. You've, sometimes it's really important to make something fast, but this is almost impossible for someone else to work out what the hell's going on. Um, this method itself is actually really apparently really old. I read an interesting blog thing about like who it actually was, and it was probably the guy who invented MATLAB, who was one of the first people who came up with it, Cleve Moller. Um, so it's an old trick from when computers were terrible, and it somehow worked its way through in the in the spirit of the times to coming down to this time. So I think that's interesting. So my advice to you is like it's kind of good to do things like this, but write more comments. If you're doing homework and you come up with something really clever, just put a comment in there about why you're doing such and such a thing. Um, there's, always, there's always this thing of like performant code, like really fast code always ends up being a little bit ugly. So I think in one of your assignment questions, you're going to have a thing of like, try and make this thing as fast as possible. Um, write nice comments, make it sure easy for people to understand what you did. Um, cool. Yeah. I'd say I won't, I won't go too much about the point about you know, what the F fast. Um, okay, cool. I won't go too much on it. I just really wanted to bring it up and I'll let you go off and watch the video yourself. We'll come back to floating point. I think it's probably better go forwards and go, we'll go back forwards and then come backwards to talk about this one. Um, there is a magic number if it's a float 64. And actually an interesting thing, sorry, it's question in the chat, is there a magic number? This magic number is not the best magic number as well. It was something else that someone worked out later. One of these interesting things about how much computers have changed since the 90s is it's completely plausible to check every float 32 on a computer. <laughs> you can just let it go and search through and find them all. So this is like an optimization, this offset, to find the best possible one. And I think people have found ones that work a little bit better now. Good luck for float 64. That's like going to take forever. But if you do the equivalent thing for float 64, it's a different offset. Um, okay. Gone into the second bit. Any questions on this stuff or are you guys happy? Somewhat happy? All right. I might call the lecture there if that's okay. Um, Thank you.